Hey guys, well I'm here to talk about some conservation action planning that Greening's been doing recently, but first of all it's amazing to see so many people here and I hardly know any of you, so I'm really excited to have a chat. Um, you mentioned there's two kinds of people, there's land managers and experts, well I'm not either of those, I'm just kind of here to learn, so um, I'm really excited about that. But uh, if we move forward through this presentation, I just want to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about over the next couple of minutes. First of all, I'll spend just one or two minutes talking about well, who are greening and what do we do because some people don't actually know what that is, some of us in greening included. Um, but I want to summarise the conservation action planning process that we've undergone over the last couple of months and then present a bit of progress you know, that we've actually undertaken. And finally, where do we go moving forward with this thing that we've come up with? Um, so if we move on, please. So Greening Australia, well, who are we and what do we do? We have a, a vision, this is a, a neat tagline that they've come up with, and that is healthy and productive landscapes where people and nature thrive. So the key to that really is that it's people and nature. We can't just sort of do things in isolation of the people that live in the landscapes. They're the key to getting stuff done, and that's how we like to operate. So Related to that, our mission then is to conserve and restore landscapes at scale through collaborative science-based uh, and innovative conservation programs. We try to do this stuff at scale. We want it to be uh, reasonably big. We're Australia's largest non-government environmental organisation and we've been doing this stuff for over 30 years. So that's at a high level what greening does. Um, if you look at the priority landscapes that greening does and would like to work in, uh, the yellow ones on the screen there are areas that we actually operate in at present and you can see there's a nice little yellow dot there over the Pilbara and then the red ones show some of the areas that we would like to start getting going in as well if we're not there already. So that's, that's the priority for us over the next handful of years. And then if we just have a quick overview of who's actually in the Pilbara, everyone's here today except for Bob I think. Is Bob here? No, not here. So first of all, you've already met Mike and most of you would have already spoken to Pip as well. Pip's based in Port Hedland and we've got ba uh, Bob based in Newman. Those guys work as part of our BHP partnership and that's about improving community capacity, trying to develop enterprise as well, training and development and education and awareness. But we also have the Pilbara Corridors project up this way as well and that spans the Fortescue catchment and that's uh, a bit of a collaboration between Rangelands and Depor and ourselves and our staff member here today is Ostian Massiani and she's the project coordinator and she's based in Karatha. So that's really about enabling and getting stuff happening on the ground. Um, so please say hi to any of those people uh, as this workshop develops. So firstly, what is conservation action planning? Uh, if you uh, want to put it in simple terms, it's really just a transparent process where we try and assess for a particular area what are the assets that we want to look after in that particular area. What are the uh, biodiversity elements that are important to us? And then associated with that, what are the things that are threatening those assets? And finally, what are we going to do to address that? What are the strategies? So conservation action planning can be used at multiple scales. It could be a single site, if you like, or it can be landscape scale, like the Pilbara. So the one that I'm going to describe today is about as big as it gets in Australia. It's a, it's a way of doing things. It's a logical process that can be used to bring large groups together to try and collaborate and uh, share their ideas and get some strategies for moving forwards. And it can be implemented by multiple organisations. So we might have a plan, but it's not owned by any one person or any one organisation. It's for everybody to take forward and to drive. And finally, it's supported by some software and there's actually a network around the world that uh, practices this sort of approach as well. So if you look at the, the conceptual cycle for this thing, first of all, you start at the top there where you conceptualise. Once you've got an idea of the area that you want to look after and what the point of the whole thing is, that's when you start planning for your actions and, and monitoring what you're doing. You then move through to actually try and implement the stuff you've planned for. After that, you analyse what you're doing. You've got to learn from what you're doing on the ground there. And if you need to change, you do. You adapt to what's going on and you improve. And finally, after that, you can capture and try and share some learning. 
So um, if you look at where we are at the moment, we're still just planning. That's all we've done. Uh, and there's, there's quite the process to get all the way around. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. So it's early days for us yet. Um, so if we move on, where has it been done before? If you click again, please. Mm -hmm. This is where uh, conservation action planning or processes very similar to it have actually been done in Australia before. The green ones are conservation action planning projects. The yellow ones are healthy country planning projects, which are very similar, but more based on uh, traditional owners uh, and having them do their stuff on the ground as well. And as you can see there, up in the top left, the Pilbara is one of the biggest examples that we've got at the moment. So if we move on, uh, the Pilbara cap, so what's the context around this thing that we're, we're running here? Well, first of all, the, the Pilbara's really big. I think we know that. Um, it's a diverse landscape, and so what that's resulted in is lots and lots of different biological or biodiversity assets that we want to look after. It's quite a complicated place uh, owing to its scale and just, just the heterogeneity within that. So related to that, there's a, lot, there's a lot of threats that are affecting these assets that we want to look after. But not only that, we've got a big diversity of stakeholders up here in the, in the Pilbara. So we've got pastoralism, we've got traditional owners, we've got a big mining focus and a whole stack of government and NGO considerations that we need to take into account. And probably importantly, it's worth mentioning there's been plenty of workshops before. There's been plenty of planning processes before uh, that try and deal with these assets and threats, at least in part. Uh, so we're not looking to reinvent the wheel with the stuff we're, we're undertaking here. It takes into account the various workshops in the past, but hopefully it learns from some of the successes and failures of, of those previous processes as well. Uh, and so in the first instance, really, this Pilbara cap is going to assist greening, rangelands and depot and the stakeholders and associates to try and just align all the things that we do to a common plan. It needs to be uh, a bit more strategic than what's been going on to date, and this is an attempt to do so. So the project boundary, it is the whole Pilbara bioregion, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, it's made up of those uh, four sub-bioregions, the Roburn, Chichester, Fortescue and Hammersley. And I've just thrown uh, Yarry Station and Spinifex Ridge up there in the top corner to show you where we are and give it a bit of scale. Um, so, first of all, in terms of the plan, I'd like to just run you through some of the biodiversity assets that have been come up with by the group. We've had three workshops to date, uh, two in Caratha, one down in Perth, to develop this list and go through it. So I'll just give you a brief summary of some of those that are relevant to where we're, where we're sitting today, not the whole Pilbara because we don't have time for that, and then just a bit of mapping about where these things actually occur in the landscape. So the first one, which is probably the most widespread across the Pilbara, is the Spinifex hummock grasslands on plains. So as you can see, it covers over a third of the study area that we've got. Um, and it's a key as asset for pastoralists, and a lot of you can uh, tell me a lot more about that. Um, over the next couple of days. But the value of this particular asset is often closely uh, linked to fire, in terms of fauna at least. Um, the fire regimes that are applied there sort of affect the, the types of biodiversity that are, are found in this asset. And they're known to support a range of threatened species, for example, the bilby, mulgara and uh, spectacled hare wallaby. So they receive a bit of attention because of those. So if we move on please. This is a map that just shows where they occur within the Pilbara bioregion. Obviously, it's a very large, extensive, significant asset uh, and it affects a lot of people. So that's one that I'd like you guys to consider today. The next asset that we'd like to look at, uh, tussock grasslands on plains. Again, I think it's quite directly relevant to, to pastoralism. Uh, these are not as extensive as the hummock grasslands. They occur mostly on alluvial plains, Gilgai plains and drainage tracts. But these are generally more susceptible to, to grazing impacts because the species that occur within these uh, are more palatable than those in, in the other asset I mentioned. Um, this asset supports a lot of priority flora species as well, but as opposed to a third of the study area, it's only about 3%, so a lot more limited. And if we look at the map, um, there's a few little scatterings over towards the east of Port Hedland, but probably the bulk of it occurs around the Roburn Plains area and a little bit uh, as it's skirting the, the north of the marsh as well. So if we move on, 
to the next asset, it's, uh, we define it as rivers, creeks and associated floodplains on open plains. It's a bit of a mouthful, but um, there you go. So it supports these woodlands of River Red Gums, Coolabar and Melaleuca. Um, and it's worth noting in the Pilbara that all the waterways are ephemeral, so the surface flow ceases for at least part of the year, and that sort of affects how these things function. Uh, they're a critical refuge for birds and for some mammals as well, including some threatened ones, including the bilby and the quoll that seem to be associated with these. And again, not a massive component by area, but disproportionately significant for biodiversity. So 5% of the, the study areas are uh, represented by those. And you can see that on the map there. So the next asset is um, springs, pools and water courses associated with gorges and ranges. So this is still a water related asset here, but it's distinct from the stuff down on the plains. This is the sort of water resource that you get up in the rocky country. Uh, so it's a bit different in terms of how it works and the types of things you find there. Uh, it has uh, substantial numbers of rare and or endemic uh, aquatic fauna elements. It does have endemic flora as well. One of the examples is the millstream fan palm. Um, and it, it's an important source of water in what is a largely dry landscape. So these, these water sources can persist for quite some time throughout the year. Um, and that attracts so, uh, some diversity of fauna as well. And an example is the Pilbara <coughs> olive python. Again, uh, very small in terms of area, about half a percent, but disproportionately important for biodiversity. And if you have a look on the map, uh, this was Pip. Next, please. This was one that was actually really hard for us to map, uh, and this still needs a bit of work to represent that spatially. But it gives you some idea of where the, the watercourses exist in those rocky areas uh, and where the pools are. But that's something we're still working on. Uh, the next asset: inland mountain ranges, rocky hills, breakaways, and mesas. So, as distinct from the plains, this is the uplands. This is the rugged country that rises up throughout the Pilbara. Um, it's quite extensive again, you can see over 40% of our study area is uh, made up of this. There's a lot of Pilbara endemic reptile species that occur within this particular asset uh, and it supports several species including quolls but also Pilbara leaf nose bats and ghost bats uh, frequent this area a lot. Uh, a lot of their natural roosts occur within this asset and rock wallabies as well. And you can see on the map it's a huge chunk of the study area. It's uh, yeah, certainly one of the largest assets to deal with. And finally, the last one is, that I'll go over today is rock piles and granites. So these are those distinct uh, boulder piles, tors that you see around the Abydos Plain and so forth, but it also includes the Burrup Peninsula. Um, it has distinct vegetation communities that surround it um, com compared to other areas in the Pilbara. And then associated with that, there's a distinct fauna assemblage that uh, hangs out in these rock piles. They, they really do represent a refuge amongst the plains um, where they occur. It's that same list of threatened species occur there as well. Uh, but in addition, given their isolated nature, there's, there's high potential for short range endemic species to occur there. So that's species with very low mobility that may occur on just one or two individual piles. Um, and about 4%. So you can see that they're scattered around the Pilbara like this. And finally, if we just look at the next slide, there's a whole stack of other assets that I could go into today, but we don't really have time. But they're those that aren't particularly relevant to where we sit today, so I chose to leave them out. But they include offshore islands, coastal mangroves and so forth, the sandy beaches and dunes, mulga communities. Uh, we decided to delineate the Fortescue Marsh as its own individual asset as well. Uh, and then there's clay pans and subterranean fauna habitat. And that last one wasn't mapped spatially, it's just a an overarching consideration that we had in our plan. So if we keep moving forward then, uh, we have all those assets and then we've got a bunch of threats that are affecting those assets. And this is a, a relatively unpleasant table that tries to summarise all of that stuff. So if you look across the, the columns, you can see the assets are placed there, but down the side there in the rows, we've got a list of the key threats. This is certainly not all of the ones that were identified by everybody in the workshops but probably the ones that are, are showing the, the highest rank. So top of the list really is weeds. Uh, next on the list is feral carnivores. Uh, I mean, none of these threats are really surprising. They're the usual suspects, I think. Weeds, feral carnivores, clearance from mining, feral herbivores, uh, the wands weeds. One that was a bit of a surprise was feral bees. 
me and some of the other greening guys kept trying to make this one disappear, but it just kept coming back up. People kept mentioning it. Um, but then there's fire regimes, more clearance, um, unsustainable stop grazing pressure, which is one that I'm keen to talk about a bit, and altered hydrology as well. So everyone at the workshops uh, sort of pulled together and we tried to rank how these things are affecting each of those different assets and that's the net result there. So if we move forward from that please. Um, out of those uh, threats, the next step is really to try and figure out well, what are strategies that you might implement to do something about that. Uh, it's worth noting as I present this today that this is an overview and as you look at these strategies, they still sit at a fairly high level. So I don't think they're at the, the point where you can actually just go out and do something. And I think we've found that out in the past, just looking at this, Mike. Um, so it needs more work. We need sort of actions and something real that attaches to these strategies. But here's one example. So if we've got weeds that are affecting uh, some of those assets, what would we want to do about it? Um, I've, I've pulled select bits out, but one tangible example is we really should have some sort of Pilbara-wide integrated weed strategy. And what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, we need to do a bit of a job of mapping and costing what weed management might entail. And that's now and into the future. We need to give people an understanding of the magnitude of that task. It's not really done yet. It's been suggested that we can use threatened species to leverage a lot of funding for weed control. I mean, if you talk to the threatened species commissioner and people like that at the moment, it's all about cats and mammals and that sort of thing. But weeds are uh, squarely linked to the health of those species. So maybe we can use some of the flavor of the month funding to, to progress this. Uh, the Pilbara Mesquite Management Committee, it was suggested that maybe they can expand their scope. They're an example of a really successful group that, uh, that just gets stuff done on the ground. So maybe we can use that model to expand the scope to a multi-tenure program. We need, need to work better with Indigenous people to get genuine knowledge of weed control and link it to working on country. Uh, that's something that's not done uh, well enough yet, according to the group and we should seek resources to implement, to genuinely implement, and that should be by Aboriginal rangers, community groups, and maybe even the Green Army if it works. And finally, implementation of a couple of programs, whether it be prickly pear and or buffalo and kapok. There's sort of specific reasons why we might pull them out as individual plans. So that's an example of a, a high level strategy that might come out of this, this process. But if we move forward, another example might be uh, reviewing the deep or prioritisation of weeds on the conservation estate. So uh, we're having trouble at the moment keeping up with what weeds are important and what weeds are not. So that's another idea. And then finally, just identifying priority assets that we think are at risk from weeds specifically. So we've got our broad assets as defined by this, but in a site specific sense, what's really important to us and what are we going to do about it? So if we move through to fire, um, the strategy here, again, it's not dissimilar really. Conceptually, it's the same. We want to develop a regional operational fire management plan. I mean, there's plenty of suggestions for research and that sort of thing, but I'm not presenting that today because I don't think that's really what we're interested in here. So any plan that we come up with for fire needs to involve multiple partners, multiple stakeholders, and it's got to be for multiple objectives. It can't just be for pastoralism or it can't just be for protection of infrastructure or biodiversity. It needs to be, be a bit more holistic than that. And hopefully we can have some chats about that over the next day or two. It must integrate traditional knowledge. Um, it's incredibly important and incredibly informative. So that needs to happen. And we need to determine everybody's motivations behind how they manage fire. And so the first on the list there is the pastoralists. I think there's a lot of people in the departments and so forth that don't necessarily understand those motivations well enough. So that should be incorporated. Uh, Aboriginal rangers could be trained for fire management under experienced leaders um, and maybe there's opportunities to develop incentives for pastoralists and indigenous people to undertake appropriate fire management so that probably means more in line with the biodiversity goals of this plan uh, and we need to develop a better strategy to monitor the outcomes and the economic investment so what ecological benefit are we getting for the dollars that we're putting in. Uh, but importantly, one of the suggestions was for fire, we should really be engaging with pastoralists via the ESRAM process. Uh, there's, it was perceived that there's more opportunity to integrate fire management 
via that process, uh, not only to help out pastoralism, to, but to protect these fire sensitive ecosystems or the biodiversity that this plan is seeking to address. And that involves identifying priority assets and areas perhaps at a, a site or a, a station scale. And finally, the last strategy that I'd like to just bring up, it was one that was a bit of a, a hot topic throughout the whole process. Lots of opinions surrounding it as well. Um, so I'm uh, open to any discussion around this and really I'm just presenting a collective set of thought. But um, I mean, even the term unsustainable stock grazing pressure was a, a fairly uh, tense term to try and, try and develop. But to try and address this particular threat, uh, a strategy might be to first of all develop a Pilbara-wide program for, for monitoring condition. So technology is proceeding at the moment, it's developing quite well, so there are some opportunities to use some of those handy tools to monitor spatially a bit better. But again, the ESRAM thing came up again. Maybe we can engage through ESRAM to ensure that landscape scale property planning, it includes the biodiversity stuff that this plan is seeking out to, to address. So. Sure, no worries. So ensuring funding and support for expansion of that ESRAM process, uh, research into stocking rates and so forth, uh, identifying high value assets that are being grazed unsustainably. So are there examples of that that we need to address specifically? Um, nutritional self shepherding and then alternate land uses on pastoral stations, is that a possibility? Um, I might just flick through these to the next slide if I can. So where to next? Well, this is a planning document. It's still sort of in draft and we're looking to put this thing out in the next couple of months. But really we're looking for anyone who's interested to try and partner on projects and further develop this plan with us. So we've got these strategies here. They might sound good, they might not, they might not sound good, but we need, we need help to further develop those. So um, me being here today is just trying to allow you to become aware of that. So the challenge really is beyond the plan to actually implement this thing and for people to stay involved, to retain ownership of it and achieve that momentum. And it's important to know that we're not finished by any stretch of the imagination. It's an ongoing process. So if we flick onto that next diagram, uh, this is the hard part, the implementing, the analysing, the learning from what we're doing and to keep that going. Uh, that's really difficult and that's where we're going to be putting our energy over the, over the next little while. Um, yep, next. And really, just some acknowledgements. I really want to acknowledge and thank all the people that contributed to the workshops and have given us the material and their opinions thus far. Um, that's critical. I'd also like to thank the partners in the project, which is Depor, Rangelands and also Gaia Resources. They did all the mapping and that sort of stuff for us as well. And yeah, to thank anyone who wants to jump on board and get involved and try and get some biodiversity uh, benefits happening in the Pilbara. So thank you.